everybody? I don't know. It's going to be hard. Are these music related? Hi. Hi, Joel. Hi, Joel. Quieting down very nicely. Good morning and welcome everyone to this year's conference, NEMA conference, the 96th annual New England Museum Conference. And it's the biggest and going to be the best yet. So we're all thrilled that you're here. I wanted to thank our musicians who have just left the stage. Um, and, uh, and So um, before I get to that, I did want to mention for all of those uh, who are still standing in the back of the room, we do have overflow rooms. So if you head to the Paul Revere room on this level, you can find a place to sit and we'll still be able to participate in the program this morning. So my name is Susan Funk and I'm proud and honored to be the president of the Board of Trustees of the New England Museum Association and particularly proud to have it here in Cambridge for the uh, first time in so many years since 1987, it's 27 years. It's about high time that we uh, brought the conference back here again. Um, and I wanted to thank, as I mentioned, the Longwood Symphony Chamber Players and these are um, uh, individuals from the medical profession who are also passionate musicians and they represent a wonderful combination of what we are all so committed to, the arts and the sciences coming together and the exciting kind of discussions and exchanges that happened, that happened therein. This year, our conference features more than 80 on-site and off-site site sessions, including exciting evening events and special things that are unique to NEMA, such as the Career Conservations Conversation Center, which is backed by popular demand. It's been very successful in the past, and really wonderful network opportunities that bring us all together as a museum community. I don't need to tell you the theme of this year's conference, but just to reiterate that the picture of health, museums, wellness, and healthy communities clearly resonates in our field. It's something that brought so many of us from around the New England region and from beyond. We even have a couple of um, participants who have come from abroad and uh, 13 other states in the country, which is really exciting. NEMA does set a high bar of excellence and engagement. Conference every year is the time when we really all come together as one to share ideas, but there are so many opportunities throughout the year, and we hope that you continue to take, take um, advantage of those. And all of this excellence that surrounds NEMA is a co really a true collaboration of an incredibly talented staff, the great leadership of Dan Yeager, and all the committed volunteers, which is really everybody in this room. Your being here is part of making this happen very, uh, very, in a very powerful way. The conference chairs work very hard to make this happen. So we want to start by thanking Carol Charno, President and CEO of Boston Children's Museum. Carl Nold, President and CEO of Historic New England. And Malcolm Rogers, the Ann and Graham Gunn Director of the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. Conference chairs really work hard to make this experience as uh, creative and as broad reaching as possible for all of you who are participating in that. And they are helped by the local committee and the program committee who really do so much of the legwork in planning the conference and work with the host institutions in Boston and Cambridge to have them, help them open the doors to invite all of you to participate what's going on. So thank you to the local committee. Could members of the local committee please stand up to be recognized? Uh, they're in the overflow room because <laughs> they were busy doing the planning. <laughs> I also want to uh, give special thanks to our presenting sponsor, Carter Gowery and the Gowery Group. And if they could please stand, the Gowery Group. I know they're somewhere oh, right over here, great. 
So we, we thank all of our sponsors. It's a really important part of having this conference come together. But the presenting sponsor really steps up in an even bigger way. And I did want to mention that uh, the um, Gowry Group has been providing insurance for Mystic Seaport for a number of years. And one of the reasons that it has been so great for us is that they understand that museums are unique institutions. And they're willing to listen and work with us to meet our needs. There aren't that many um, whale ships, for example. I'm from Mystic Seaport. Um, there aren't that many whale ships out there to be insured. So the kind of conversations that we were able to have with them really help us meet our individual and specific needs, which is really critical. So thank you very much. And uh, finally, I'm going to introduce Anita Walker, who is the Executive Director of the Massachusetts Cultural Center for our official welcome to Boston. Anita. Good morning, everyone. I'm Anita Walker, Executive Director of the Massachusetts Cultural Council. We are the state agency that enthusiastically invests in your work in every corner of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And I have to tell you, if there is any doubt in anybody's mind about the health of the museum world, they should just take one step in this room and take a look around. I cannot tell you how awesome it is to see so many of you that have joined together here. I know you're going to have a terrific conference. The panel that is assembled here, um, I happen to know some of these pre people personally, and if you don't, you are in for an absolute treat. You're going to be hearing from some of the very best and the brightest uh, in our world here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Some of you who um, I know, and I know that there are many here in this room, have probably heard me talk a little bit about uh, what our role is as a state agency. And um, we find that our work, and by that I mean your work, our collective work, has such a powerful impact in so many ways and in so many places uh, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. But I'm always very attuned to the fact that we should never lose sight of what the core of our work is. So when I talk to people about what the Massachusetts Cultural Council is, and please substitute the word museum for Massachusetts Cultural Council, I like to say that we are not an economic development department. But when we do our work well, economic prosperity is a happy consequence. Same for museums. We are not the Department of Education. But when every child in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts has an opportunity to participate in the arts and culture in school and go to museums, they get a better education. We are not a human services agency. But when our most vulnerable young people in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts have an opportunity to participate in the arts and culture and history, their lives are transformed and in literally thousands of cases, their lives are saved. And now, inspired by this conference, I'm going to have to add a new verse to my riff, which is we're not the Department of Health. <laughs> but when the citizens of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts have an opportunity to go to museums and go to plays and go to concerts and participate in the arts and history, they are healthier people and our communities are healthier places. I want to say one thing that I think is the most important thing that I can say to you this morning, and that is thank you. Thank you for your passion. Thank you for the work that you do. Thank you for the contributions you make to your states and your communities. I have a small idea of how hard you work every single day. I know the extra hours, the passion, the creativity, the scholarship, the leadership, the community engagement that you participate every single day. We try as hard as we can uh, with the resources that we're able to secure to invest in that. And we do that because we know the value of that work. We can talk about the economic development, the educational impact, and so on and so forth. But for me, the most important reason for a public investment in your work 
is because you truly are the caretakers of what's best in all of our states. And shouldn't that belong to everybody? Our modest investment in the work of the museums and other cultural organizations in the Commonwealth is our way of making stakeholders out of every single person here. So that whether they're walking into the Museum of Fine Arts or any of our historic places, they can say, this belongs to me. I want to thank you for sharing that. You're going to have an amazing, amazing opportunity for a conversation here. And um, I'm going to give you just a little bit of a heads up. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, Lisa Wong happens to sit on the Mass Cultural Council, and I know she's going to be talking about a new endeavor that we are launching uh, here in Massachusetts. I can always count on our organizations to step up when called upon. Okay, the name of the new program is UP. <laughs> Lisa will tell you more about it, but we're really challenging our organizations in Massachusetts to make this the most accessible place on the planet for arts and culture so that everyone can participate. Lisa will tell you more about it, so I won't um, take away her talking points. But um, again, thank you for all you're doing. Thank you for coming here today. Thanks for the New England Museum Association for hosting and for your leadership. Well, thank you, Anita. I always have to amp up the octane when I follow Anita Walker to the, to the podium. Uh, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Dan Yeager, the Executive Director of the New England Museum Association, and it's now my pleasure to introduce our keynote sponsor, Julie Vale of Marquee Design. Julie's company is one of the most outstanding design and branding firms in the Northeast. For the past two years, Julie and the folks at Marquee have worked with NEMA to develop a new brand and a new communications channel, including our redesigned website and New England Museums Now, our online journal, of which we are extremely proud. Please join me in thanking Julie for her time and her talents. Julie Vale. Thank you, Dan. We are very, very excited to be here today. As Dan mentioned, we've been working with NEMA for the last couple years to help improve and elevate and design a new identity for the organization, which touches all of you. Um, we have established a new brand identity from the ground up, as well as a number of different marketing pieces, including a new museum's website, which is launching this week, which we're very excited about. Um, which we hope all of you will participate in and put your museum's profile up on the site so that more people can see and, and take advantage of the um, SEO that NEMA has enjoyed over the years and bring your organizations to the forefront for many tourists and, and locals alike. NEMA is a great organization to us, and we have um, a lot of pride in um, the conference theme today, which is health and wellness. It's a personal um, sort of crusade for me, if you will. Um, I'm constantly looking for balance and, and um, healthy foods and nutrition and all sorts of things on a personal level. Um, but as a business owner, and what we do for a living is help all of you and your organizations thrive. So as you're here this week and learning about new things and evaluating the um, health and wellness of your own museum and your organization, I ask you to also look at your brand. Is it communicating what it needs to communicate? Are you as buttoned up as you want to be? Are you presenting yourselves in a way to your audiences that is clear, cohesive, consistent, and compelling? So. As we are around this week, feel free to ask us questions. We'd be happy to talk with you. Um, but more importantly, you know, this is a time for all of you to come together, learn from each other, and share experiences and best practices. And as we are here this week, we hope to um, help engage that conversation around your, your brand and identity. So without further ado, I will give the mic back to Dan. Thanks again. Thank you so much, Julie, I appreciate it. It's now my pleasure to introduce someone who in our field needs no introduction. 
It's also with a bit of sadness because, as many of you know, Ford Bell has announced his retirement from the helm of the American Alliance of Museums effective next spring. Ford's been instrumental in transforming AAM into the Alliance, a vibrant community of institutions across our country, working hard to advance the cause of museums everywhere. I was honored to welcome Ford at my very first NEMA conference as executive director, and I'm doubly honored to welcome him today at his last NEMA conference as president and CEO of the American Alliance of Museums. Ford, thank you for all your contributions to our field. Thanks, Dan. It's great to be here once more. Um, I have been to several NEMA annual meetings since I came to AAM in 2007, and it is always a great meeting. Congratulations to Dan and his team and everybody here for uh, creating such a successful conference. Over 1,100 attendees. That's absolutely fantastic. And I salute you for putting health in your theme this year. Uh, I think this is an extremely important area for our field. Um, I often talk about museums and healthcare, and people say to me, Ford, why would a museum be concerned about health or healthcare? And I say it's, well, you have to understand that first and foremost, museums are community institutions, and they are committed to meeting community needs, and there is no greater community need than health and well-being. So I salute you on doing that. I've been asked to give an update on things in Washington, and I take that not to mean anything related to the recent election. <clears throat> We've all heard enough about that, probably to last a lifetime. So I'll stick to matters related to AAM, and, and which will hopefully be a safer and more rewarding topic. Update is an appropriate word. We just <clears throat> heard something about up, and um, up is where we're headed at the Alliance right now. It certainly describes our institutional membership. We're just a short distance from achieving our year-end goal of 4,000 museum members. And that would mean an astounding 60% growth in institutional membership since we launched our new tiered membership program in September of 2012. We now have the highest number of museum members in AAM's 108 year history. And the options for museum membership that we've made available are extremely popular. Over 7,000 museum professionals have been able to take advantage of the all staff add-on package to become individual members of the Alliance at no cost to them. And museums of all types and sizes are taking advantage of the all staff package to provide an affordable, valued benefit to their staffs. In 2008, we pledged to create a more meaningful and accessible accreditation program, and that is now a reality. Earlier this year, we launched the, the new first-time accreditation component and it is radically different from the old model. If our old accreditation program resembled an overgrown jungle of papers, processes, procedures, and prerequisites, then we hacked out a lot of useless underbrush. The stealth study is now online, eliminating the 35 or more pounds of paper that people were submitting for their self studies. I've said from the beginning, that this is not AAM's accreditation program, it is the field's accreditation program, and we've made that a reality. We just completed our first ever open selection process for the Accreditation Commission, the body that oversees the program for the field. Forty people from museums of every size and type self-nominated for five positions on the commission. And a first ever nominating committee from the field selected the five names to present to our chair Kaywin Feldman, and I'm very grateful to Carol Charno for serving on that committee. These new commissioners represent a wide range of institutions, from a large art museum in San Juan, Puerto Rico, to a mid-sized historical society just down the road from here, actually just offshore a ways. And we have a great team heading up the accreditation program right now. Under Janet Vaughn's leadership, they're committed to helping museums from the first step on the continuum of excellence, which is the Pledge of Excellence, up to accreditation. If your institution hasn't signed the Pledge of Excellence, I hope you will do that today. Our international outreach continues to expand. One of my goals from the time I arrived at AAM 
was to promote greater collaboration and cohesion among museums in our hemisphere. We are neighbors, after all, and neighbors are good at sharing. We have lots to share among ourselves, stories, artifacts, exhibitions, ideas, knowledge, and of course, our heritages. Next October, we will co-host a Conference of the Americas in Buenos Aires, a convening that I hope will become a part of the rhythms and traditions of the museum field. And you'll be able to learn more about this convening on our website in the coming weeks. On October 6th, we launched Museum Junction, the new online community for the museum field. Museum Junction allows you to connect with museum professionals around the country and around the world. You can share knowledge and expertise and learn from your colleagues across the spectrum of museum types and sizes. It's off to a great start and I hope you'll join that conversation. This new resource is available to everyone, members and non-members alike. I don't need to tell you, I'm sure, that Elizabeth Merritt continues to do outstanding work at our Center for the Future of Museums. Our goal right now is to continue to build capacity in the center so that Beth can stop being a one-woman band and so the Senator can exp center can exp expand the resources and services that it offers to the field. And I'll close with a word about advocacy. First of all, our seventh Museum's Advocacy Day will take place February 23rd through 24th, and I hope you will join us in Washington. The impact and importance of advocacy for our field is undeniable. In 2009, we hosted our first Advocacy Day, and that year, we circulated a Dear Colleague letter in support of funding for the Institute of Museum and Library Services. 25 members of Congress signed on to our letter that year, including zero senators. This year, 119 representatives signed on, along with 29 senators. And we set a record with seven Republican representatives signing our letter or sending a letter of their own in support of the Office of Museum Services at IMLS. Advocacy matters. We need to do it together. The biggest impact that we can possibly have on funding for, for museums through IMLS, NEA, NEH, NSF, and other agencies, agencies will be by speaking with one strong voice, not as zoos or children's museums or science and technology centers or art museums, but as a field, a gloriously diverse field that has enormous impact on every aspect of life in the 21st century. A field that changes lives, a field that is uniquely positioned to help our country create an equitable, sustainable, successful 21st century. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Ford. Thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here with us today. Uh, your legacy of leadership will be felt here in New England and across the country for many years to come. Once more, Ford Bell. <clears throat> so I'd like to add my welcome to the 96th annual NEMA conference, and what a conference it's turned out to be. For the second year in a row, you've helped us break the record for NEMA conference attendance with more than 1,200 of you now and counting showing up for three days of learning and professional friendship. And we're extremely excited by all this because it shows your passion and enthusiasm for NEMA's mission and programming. It also shows your pro uh, passion and enthusiasm for spending three days in Cambridge and Boston, something we haven't done in 27 years. With so many of us in attendance, our conference this year has a terrific energy, and we know that it will also have its special challenges, too. Lines may be a little longer for food and coffee. Sessions may be a little more cozy, shall we say. So we're more determined than ever to give you an excellent conference experience. You may have noticed uh, some folks wearing a bright yellow button that says Conference Ambassador. If you have a question, for, look for an ambassador who will be happy to help out. Will all of our ambassadors please stand just to recognize you and get a sense of who's, who's in the room. And uh, Thank you, ambassadors. <laughs> 
I want to remind you that sessions are on a first come, first seated basis. So my advice to you is if a particular session is top priority, stake out your claim early. You may want to have a first and check second choice for any time slot, so if a session is full, you can quickly find another. We'll do our part to make sure you have plenty of coffee, treats, and everything else you need to keep you fueled and fired up. And if I can do anything for you personally over the next 72 hours, please let me know. NEMA is extremely grateful for all of the supporters for this year's conference who are instrumental in helping us produce the best event possible. Our event, uh, exhibit hall rather, which opens tomorrow in this ballroom, features 53 booths with the latest museum related products and services. I encourage you to visit very early and very often as well. Our scholarship sponsors this year include Laura Roberts, Cynthia Robinson, John Nicholas Brown Center for Public Humanities and Cultural Heritage at Brown University, and University Products. Bronze level sponsors include Creative Ground and Museum Rails. Silver level sponsors include Art Shipping International, Beyond Genocide, and POW, AKA Paul Orselli Workshop. Gold sponsors this year are Tufts University Museum Studies Program, Museum Trek by Trek Solver, University of Massachusetts Amherst Public History Program, Johns Hopkins Museum Studies Program, and Mystic Scenic Studios. Platinum level sponsors include Art New England, Alexander Haas, Huntington T. Block, Cambridge Savings Bank and Cambridge Appleton Trust, QM Squared, Smith & St. John, and U.S. Trust Bank of America Private Wealth Management. Titanium level sponsors include Marquee Design, Museum Search and Reference, and on Tour Toursphere. And once again, a sincere special thank you to our conference presenting sponsor, the terrific folks at the Gallery Group. Please give the Gallery Group and all of our sponsors a big round of applause, please. This year's conference theme, Picture of Health, Museums, Wellness, and Healthy Communities, was inspired by the fact that the Boston area is a world-renowned uh, area for both its cultural community and its healthcare field. Museums are more and more developing programs that promote the well-being of their audiences, and we thought this would be a perfect opportunity to shine a spotlight on a very important trend. When we contemplated the keynote session, we decided to pull together a blue ribbon dream team panel of experts from the two worlds of museums and healthcare, challenging them to challenge us with their perspectives, ideas, and opinions. I'm extremely honored to introduce them now. Representing the museum community, we have our conference chairs, Carol Charnow, president and CEO of Boston Children's Museum, Carl Knoll, president and CEO of Historic New England, and Malcolm Rogers, Annan Graham Gunn, director of the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston. Representing the healthcare community, we have Dr. Lisa Wong, a musician, pediatrician, past president of the Longwood Symphony Orchestra, whose music we enjoyed as we entered the ballroom today, current board member of the Massachusetts Cultural Council, and professor at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Joel Katz is also professor at Harvard Medical School and is vice chair for education at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Formerly a commercial artist, Dr. Katz utilizes the humanities to include and improve medical education. He's the director of the Harvard Medical School course, Training the Eye, Improving the Art of Physical Di Diagnosis. Guiding the discussion today is Jared Bowen, Emmy Award winning executive editor and host for Arts at WGBH Boston, where he hosts Open Studio with Jared Bowen and appears regularly with Emily Rooney on Greater Boston. His interviewing skills are unparalleled, so I'm sure we can expect a lively and informative discussion. No pressure. The audience is invited to participate by asking questions and offering comments of your own, which you can do by tweeting hashtag NEMA2014, or if you prefer, and this, the tweeting, by the way, is good for the folks in our spillover rooms, uh, or if you prefer the old-fashioned way, uh, we have mics that our volunteers will be uh, offering you throughout uh, the, uh, the, the presentation. We we'll anticipate about 20 minutes of questions toward the end of the presentation. So with that, let's welcome the 2014 keynote panel. So just to establish what we hope to do today is to just have a conversation, no formal structure. So there can be interjection, there can be conversation, no chair throwing. We like to save that for the theater conference. <laughs> They're a little bit more dramatic. Uh, but I just want to start by 
an observation I made twice, and I'm, I apologize for starting on a lower note, but I covered the events of September 11th and the fallout, which obviously was just terribly impactful and dramatic in the Boston community. And then I did that again, unfortunately, last year with the Boston Marathon bombings. And in both instances, what I found immediately afterward were that people, especially in the Boston community, which had been hit so hard because it happened right here, gravitated toward culture and museums, and they needed to find some sort of healing. So to get a sense of wellness in the art community, in the museum community, I, just to get a picture of the landscape and what you were able to do and what your observations are, I'm wondering how you found that experience and how you found people in those moments. Malcolm Rogers, I'll start with you because if memory serves, in the days right after the marathon bombings, you opened up the museum for free admission knowing that people would probably seek some sort of solace. Absolutely. Well, something I believe in passionately is that art is for everyone. Whether they're happy or sad, we have something to offer people. And for many people, the museum is seen as a refuge. But our mission is to bring art and people together. And I think central to what we're talking about this morning is how do we serve the people who can't necessarily come to the museum? If we don't go beyond our walls, I think it's true of every institution now, if we don't go beyond our walls, we're not leading members of the community. We're not fulfilling our mission. Uh, some of you will know that the museum recently commissioned a survey called uh, Culture Track Boston. I think it's available to all arts institutions on our website. But one of the leading reasons for people visiting the museum, not the leading reason, but was to relieve stress in their lives. I suspect there can be no more stressful time in people's lives than they're, when they're in the hands of wonderful people like Dr. Katz, when their families are waiting in hospitals and so on. How can we help? I have a passion for that. And Carol, you I probably, saw, I would imagine, saw a rise in families. I mean, people came yeah. together at that time, and even in their own families. And there was a lot of questions about how to speak to children and how, how children would process this. And I'm, I'm sure that's something that you. Yes, I mean, I wanted to give a shout out. Many of my staff are here today. Um, immediately following the marathon bombing, we all kind of came together very quickly and said, what can we do? Many of the staff themselves had been affected either they had we had family or uh, friends that were at the uh, finish line. We had medical professionals, relatives, and so forth. And what was so um, awe-inspiring in me is how the staff immediately rallied around the community. Almost instantly, we went down into the museum. Um, there weren't a lot of people there at that moment, because if you remember, there was the question of the JFK library and so forth. But uh, whoever was in the museum, staff kind of flooded the museum and just were there with the families in the museum. And the next day, as you said, we had hundreds of people from the marathon come to the Children's Museum with their families. Um, they wore their jerseys. Um, we were down on the floor. We created a kind of a wishing tree where people could send messages. We immediately called all the hospitals that were treating uh, patients and uh, asked them what they needed, and they said, send toys, send books. And personally, I mean, these are my staff at the museum. They just got out of the museum with gift bags, went to all the hospitals, and then the next thing the hospitals asked us for was passes for the staff, for the families of the physicians. Um, this grew and grew. Eventually, uh, about three weeks later, we opened the entire museum to all first responders in the greater Boston area and then beyond uh, for free for the whole month of uh, May. And you know, following on from what Malcolm just said, what's extraordinary is how museum professionals are so passionate about community. And I think at these times of uh, great need in the community, we are seen to some extent as sacred places where people go for solace, for comfort, for inspiration, and the fact that museums um, are stepping up to heal the community at those critical times is, is, is I'm very, very proud and humbled by that. Yeah, and Carl, I think I, or I'll get to the doctor. We won't always separate it, museums against doctors, I promise you, even though they seated themselves that way. Um. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I'm going to chime in now also because um, 
Uh, this is from the musical side, but um, our orchestra being medical professionals, we actually had first responders who were members of the orchestra. Um, one of our violinists was in the emergency room working as an attending that day, and, one, and our clarinetist is the, uh, the chief Mark Gephardt is the chief of orthopedics at the Beth Israel Hospital. He lives down the street, and as soon as he heard about uh, the marathon bombing, he went back to the hospital so that he could lead his team. Um, and so we had a discussion about this, and our, our concert was coming up a few weeks later, and they decided that we would play a piece called Nimrod um, by Elgar without conductor to really bring the, the community together. And just as, as you said, we used culture for healing. There was no conductor. He was sitting in the cello section. And you could just sort of feel that the audience and the orchestra was just one circle of, of healers to experience this peace together and sort of honor the, the first responders, honor the, um, the victims, and honor the, 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 the really brave uh, runners who also who uh, had gone through so much trauma. So as you said, culture really is a way to heal. Carl, before I get to you, I was going to ask Dr. Katz, what do we know about people and why, in a situation like that, they do gravitate towards concerts, to museums, and, and either have a, a very intimate one-on-one -on -one experience with a piece of art, or just find themselves in a sense of community? Uh, thank you. And first of all, let me just say how honored I am to be here. I've been at a lot of forums around the country, and this is def definitely the hippest crowd I've ever been to. <laughs> so I appreciate being included. Um, well, I, I would say I'm not an expert in human nature, but I do see a lot of suffering in my practice, and I think that uh, events like the bombing and other tragic events uh, force people to confront uh, aspects of their lives that are hard to explain uh, and uh, for which they seek uh, solace and uh, uh, partnership, and I think that's in many ways what art is all about. Uh, so I, in, it affected the bombing affected all of us in many different ways, but as I interacted with both healthcare professionals and with uh, patients, I would say I noticed that even the art in the hospital was something that people were turning to more in a different way. It's a it's an underappreciated aspect of this connection, uh, but particularly at some of our local hospitals, they, uh, you know, I think the good artwork uh, can really help you reflect on what it's all about, what the meaning is. And I, I, I noticed that. Jared, there's another aspect, too. That every comment we've had so far is about community and community coming together at a time of crisis. The question then is, why is it to the museum that you come in a time of crisis? Uh, and there's some very good research going back to 2000 that AAM did, and more recent research, uh, 2010 to the present in the UK, that show that museums are among the most trusted institutions in their community. So because of that trust that we've established over a long period of time, people feel comfortable coming to us um, and being a part of the museum community um, in those times of crisis. And we've seen that continuing um, here in Boston uh, as the follow-up to um, the Boston Marathon bombing crisis um, as museums have come together to help with the memory of that and to preserve the artifacts from the memorials. Um, and there's been a great collaboration um, with leadership from NEMA um, to save things so that we can help deal with the continuing grief and memorialization of what happened. I think there's one more aspect that um, both medicine and that medicine and, and, and um, the arts have, which is the museums bring us to a central beauty. We are seeking beauty. And in health, we are seeking health. We're not treating disease uh, for the sake of treating the disease. It is always to reestablish health and reestablish the beauty of humanity. So I think a museum and a hospital are not so very different in that way. Mm -hmm. And Lisa, we've spoken already, and, and you spent some time in London where, where, where this has taken hold. I mean, where are we at this point in terms of, is, is, where are we in terms of how museums are adapting this practice and realizing this is part of their responsibility at this point? In London or here? Or in here. How is it, do you see it suddenly taking hold in, in the it, States? It's very exciting. Uh, well, last, last uh, year in September, uh, Mass Cultural Council sponsored a trip to the UK to look at um, their policies in, in universal design and accessibility on every level, not just physical level, but also um, with tactile displays and um, 
um, arts for, for people living with autism or Alzheimer's and to bring back some of that inspiration here. And what's really been exciting is to be seeing that really around the country, um, people are really thinking in that way. I just came from a conference at the Mayo Clinic uh, this week that was being driven by the art therapists, the art educators, and, um, and physicians on arts and healthcare. And so now I'm coming to this conference where the conference is the museum educators coming. So I really feel that the circle is beginning to complete itself again. Arts and health were never so far apart until we got more interested in the technology and the te technical aspects of both. And it's time to bring those back together. And the more collaborations we can do uh, from both and the more we can educate each other, the better it's going to be. For museum panelists, are you at a point now where it is part of your mission? Yes. yes. We actually, uh, four years ago, we did a, a major strategic plan and we made health and wellness one of our top uh, goals. And we probably tripled the amount of health and wellness programs that we do in the museum now, thanks to the leadership of Saki Yamamoto, who is our health and education, well, health education uh, educator, um, including a new program called Morningstar <coughs> Access, which opens the museum very early hours in the morning for uh, children with severe immunodeficiency illnesses, uh, their siblings, children with severe autism. Um, and this has become, almost overnight, this enormous uh, success. People are lining up for you know, this, this program. They really feel like they need the museum to help with their child's health, the parents. Mm -hmm. So yes, this has become a very important part of our programming now, very central. It's obviously uh, gaining strength, this movement, but there are certain key rules, I think. First of all, museums need to find very strong partners to work on programs like this. We obviously need a committed outreach department, an education department at the museum, and you'll be hearing some of my staff talk about this later in the conference. And we need dedicated individuals who can be ambassadors for the program in hospitals like Dr. Katz. Unless you've got an advocate within the walls, it's very difficult to get this going. And then you need passionate philanthropists. And for instance, between the museum and Brigham and Women's, we share many, many philanthropists and collectors, and that's a huge help. A bit of a, an anecdote, when I first came to Boston, I was working to try and get Hunting Avenue renamed the Avenue of the Arts, and I talked to one or two hospital leaders in those days and said, have you thought about marketing the idea of the art of healing? And to an extent, I felt I was greeted with blank looks. <laughs> as, the as the whole nature of medicine has changed, and its role in people's life is changing so fast, it now makes sense, I believe. I love that idea. <laughs> I think even in, in museums of smaller size that don't have the opportunity to have exhibitions or specific programs is another factor that enters into what we're talking about today. And that's very much the role that we play in creating quality of life in our communities. Um, and I think every museum should have that as a part of its mission, and indeed does have that as a part of its mission. Um, you know, whether for a historical museum, it's uh, preserving open space and preserving um, historic places that, uh, that interest people in preserving the memory of a place. And general well-being that we bring through education, through uh, cultural activities. I think all of those things are present and should be in every museum. So it opens it up for all of us to have it as part of our mission. Uh, I'm sure there are people uh, in this audience who are thinking, you know, we, we work <coughs> with very limited dollars and we don't necessarily have the resources with which to have the, the programs that you have all spoken about. So what about the naysayers who are not naysayers, but the, the concerned people who say, maybe we shouldn't be, maybe we should focus on our mission of, of art, if, if that's the budget that we have at this point. <laughs> um, okay. I told you, philanthropists are very important. Resources are very, very important. But I have to say that the American people as a whole, by virtue of uh, the charitable gift tax deduction by virtue of the Massachusetts Council. The, the, the broad people of America are investors in the cultural institutions, and it's a, a moral duty to repay that investment. If you have to reallocate resources, fine, but you shouldn't be leaving any part of the population untouched. By, we're repaying an investment. 
Do you know that um, I also, I don't think you have to have an enormous amount of money to be concerned about the health and well-being of the community. Um, I would be surprised if there was one museum in the uh, Commonwealth that, uh, in New England that was not somehow addressing community engagement, as, as Carl said, open space, enjoyment of their galleries, um, thinking about health and wellness in some way. I mean, programs, as we know, don't have the same level of expense as an exhibition. And I, I think if people take a somewhat of a toe-in-the-water approach, which is kind of my tagline at the Children's Museum, because we actually don't have a lot of funding, um, I think that there are ways, I mean, even, for example, this wishing tree I mentioned, um, we've used this quite a lot. We just have made a kind of a wooden sculpture of a tree, and we have cards uh, where people can write their thoughts and feelings, and we have staff there to discuss things with them. In fact, that was also a part of the uh, marathon exhibition, mm -hmm. um, which was extremely effective and is something you know that could be done for $20. You know? So I, I think it's just an intention more than just an ambition, necessarily, about how people approach their work. And I, I agree with Carol completely that there are a lot of things that can be done at low to no cost. Um, museums were among the first to embrace uh, First Lady Michelle Obama's program, Let's Move, that was announced in 2010. And AAM and the Association for State and Local History encourage museums to sign up, which is a very simple thing. And it's basically about um, childhood obesity and getting people just active, getting children active and getting families active. And, and you know, it really didn't take any cost to implement that uh, in a museum. I remember a couple of years ago, I was on a panel um, with Agnes Gunn, the chairman of the uh, um, Museum of Modern Art, and I was amazed to find that both of us in our speeches had the same example of ways we were reaching new communities. Um, I said, well, the Governor John Langdon House in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, were offering yoga on Saturday morning so that people can come in who might not otherwise come in. And Agnes Gunn said, well, at the Museum of Modern Art in New York on 54th Street, we're having yoga in the lobby, uh, you know, to bring people in. So, you know, there's a very simple thing that we were using to build audiences, to reach uh, new people, um, bring them into the museum, and one that was encouraging wellness and health. Uh, I would just, your question uh, pulls me back to when this all started for me a couple, decade or more ago. And at that time, I was tasked by the medical students in the medical school to think about how we could incorporate art into education, another aspect of this. And to me, the biggest challenge is, oh my gosh, how do I make connections in the art world? The finances of it were fairly minimal, I would say. And then just by very fortuitous luck, a mutual fr friend connected me with uh, Barbara Martin at the MFA. And I discovered that they were in the same situation. They were interested in reaching out to their community. We are right in their backyard and vice versa. And the biggest barrier was not the finances. It was the connection. And once we had made that connection, I think the majority of what we're doing now and what's growing is uh, not expensive. Are there illnesses or conditions that you find are better suited to this type of therapy. When I was going through my research for this discussion, I kept seeing post-traumatic stress disorder from veterans, Alzheimer's, and autism. But are, are, are there those areas where you focus, or, or is it completely across, I'm sure it's across the board, but, but is there a starting point for people? I think it's across the board, except uh, those three particular illnesses stand out because they are where language communication fails. And art as a third thing is sometimes will touch a place of healing that you can't reach through um, verbal communication. And children with autism, for example, have, have verbal communication skills but um, may excel in art making, music making, and also art appreciation. And um, the people at Artists for Alzheimer's, for example, will, will tell stories of bringing patients with Alzheimer's to museums and hearing just insights that we ourselves would not have seen because we're, we have so many other layers of thought that they just go to the sort of the, the core of the piece of art that they're looking at. Dr. Katz, you have, to, to follow this thread into the hospitals, you have your program Training the Eye where you're using art for your medical students. How are you using art? Um, well, it's a little bit of the flip, and I just would say, be before I launch into that question, that the 
the work that's being done with patients uh, and healing uh, is fantastic. And some of our local hospitals have really done groundbreaking projects, including the ones that you're talking about. The work that I do specifically is what you're now describing, which is to help healthcare professionals of all flavors, medical students, physicians, nurses, physical therapists, et cetera, to do their job better, if you will, to be more effective at it. The course that you mentioned, Training the Eye, is a course that we've run at Harvard Medical School for first-year medical students, uh, teaching them the core competencies in physical examination, uh, which the very first aspect of physical examination is to look carefully. Uh, and unfortunately, with the technological bent of um, medical training and medical care, uh, there are too many examples where the healthcare providers turn to very expensive and unnecessary tests rather than simply connecting and looking at their patients. So we've found that if we teach this very early in medical school in the first year, uh, it can change the trajectory of the, of the students in this case. Uh, we have a series of uh, didactics and museum, and museum exercises, uh, mostly at the MFA, a couple of them at the Gardner Museum, with many, many fabulous uh, uh, professional arts educators, including some in this room, uh, and go through exercises with the students on linking, on identifying visual clues and linking that to the inner meaning, to the deeper meaning. And then we directly translate that to looking carefully at patients and uh, figuring out the physiology and the pathophysiology that might be explaining their particular situation. So in the, in the class you mentioned, that's how we do it. And it's been a very uh, rewarding and fully multi-dimensional, uh, multi-partner collaborative effort. I'm fascinated with the work we're doing on helping with diagnosis and so on. But I also noticed that in programs that we mount, we're talking about team building amongst yes. interns. Yes. Could you tell me a little bit more about that? I will, thank you for that question. So um, Malcolm is referring <laughs> to a second, uh, completely unrelated curriculum that's grown out of this first curriculum. And uh, one of the challenges faced by care providers is that in the information age, um, medicine is no longer a single person sport, if you will. Every, all care and health maintenance is done in very uh, interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, collaborative teams. And unfortunately, I will be the first one to admit that physicians are not trained to work well in multidisciplinary teams. Uh, and you can see that all over the hospital. Um, I don't want to pick on any departments, but it happens everywhere. And so we've and, and, and the ACGME, the Accreditation Council for Medical Education, has recognized this and actually requires all training programs to teach teamwork. But there are simply no models for teaching teamwork. Uh, so so our, how does art help? Yeah, so our collaborators uh, thought about this and looked at it, and we created a curriculum where we bring full teams, medical care teams, to the MFA. Uh, uh, the, students, the interns, the residents, the attending physicians, the nurses, the physical therapists, the care coordinators, the ward clerks, uh, and we go through a series of exercises that require teamwork. And there's a lot of metacognition involved in it and uh, interpretive, I can go into a lot of details if you want to, uh, but we go through exercises that require collaborative thinking and collaborative working. And it's so beautiful to watch the team, how the team changes from before we do it until after we do it. And they really function much more effectively. They know each other as human beings. Um, I, I would say that this is very much of an example of a um, challenge in the healthcare environment that we were lucky enough to solve at the Art Museum. Uh, I think art allows people to step outside of their biases and their preconceptions. Uh, uh, nobody knows more than anyone else does. They're all, every team member is on the same plane. Uh, it, you know, being in a fabulously beautiful environment like an art museum distances the anxiety and inhibitions that are fairly uh, rampant in healthcare teams where you're caring for critically <coughs> ill people and everyone is supposed to fit into a very narrow predefined role 
but those roles, it turns out, are uh, inhibitory to good teamwork. Yeah, to come back to the museum, Malcolm, if you don't mind, I'll start asking the questions again, if, if, if that's OK. <laughs> <laughs> He's retiring. I can say whatever I want now. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, just to come back into the museums, have you identified parts of your collections that you, that you find are areas that you find are more resonant when it comes to wellness and healing? I think you'd have to ask my colleagues about that, but I would be surprised if almost everything in the museum wasn't relevant. I always think in the museum, everything that's there represents the very best of human achievement, and it represents a sort of permanence. The majority of the art in the museum was created by people who are no longer living, to be honest. But this, this expression of permanence, but also the awareness of mutability, uh, to realize that is a very strengthening philosophical concept. I, I once uh, remember, no, I, I don't need to tell that. <laughs> so, I am looking, I have my dermatological examination next week, and I'm looking forward to the day when the dermatologist says to me, and by the way, do you mind we have a young curator with us? Could I bring him <laughs> in too? <laughs> The experience that Joel's um, describing is also uh, says something about healing the healer and how important that is, um, because especially our young residents who are just getting into this field and may not have built the calluses that um, that some of us old dinosaurs have, um, it, it they they are also burying a lot of pain. Um, and w when I was with Barbara Martin at, at your museum, we were looking at one of the modern exhibits of the, the glass structures that have mirrors so that it goes on infinitely, uh, the reflections go on infinitely. And they said when um, one of the residents was looking at that, a memory of feeling at three o'clock in the morning in the emergency room, that one more, one more of, of images of things that just looked exactly the same to them uh, came, back to, came back to him and he said, you know, he made sort of a conscious effort after that not to look at every patient as just another patient coming at me rather than um, being individual uh, people. So that brought that out from that piece of art. And I'll share a brief anecdote that I think gets to your question. Um, the, the, we have a, another curriculum called our humanistic curriculum, which is required for all interns in medicine uh, with the notion of trying to combat uh, burnout and fatigue and uh, disillusionment that can happen in the rigors of training. And uh, so within that curriculum, one of the exercises we do is uh, on um, thinking of art as a metaphor for your own life. And uh, I've been teaching this for a while, and I like to go to representational artwork. And one of my favorites is the uh, Copley painting of Watson being attacked by the sharks. And you can imagine if you ask that question to an intern, how does this image relate to your work? Um, it's a very rich discussion. Um, and so uh, one of the wonderful arts educators at the MFA challenged me, you know, have you ever tried this with a completely abstract piece of work? And so I said no, and I'd be scared to, but she convinced me to ask that same question, how does this image relate to your work? Uh, in front of a Jackson Pollock painting. And it was a very different discussion, but it gets to what uh, Malcolm was saying. There was, the discussion was rich and deep, and it, almost any artwork, uh, there is an opportunity to learn from. I wanted to just give a little bit of advice to people who are starting to think about uh, doing some of these programs in their museums. Um, and going back to a point Malcolm made about partnerships, I think, you know, if we were just to go to our local hospitals and uh, uh, very, uh, you know, uh, medical schools and so on and say, how can we help you? Um, for example, we have um, annually a countdown to kindergarten day where we invite all the incoming kindergartners in the Boston Public Schools to come and experience the museum. And through the kind of genius of my staff, um, they partnered with um, Tufts School of Dental Medicine. Um, they found out that you know, uh, the schools were concerned about children not getting to the dentist and said, well, would you mind if we set up um, a, a dental examination for children at this uh, countdown to kindergarten day? So sure enough, um, every year, Casey, oh, I see sitting right over there, uh, organizes these uh, wellness checkups right in the museum. So I think it's a question of thinking a little bit out of the box 
uh, thinking about your space not only as a place of celebrating the art or the history that you're working on, but as a kind of an urban meeting place, a trusted place where people are coming and they, they come with their whole self. So they're not just coming just to look at art today. They have other aspects of their lives that you could address in the museum. Um, and so I think it's just a question of, as I said before, an intention and working more closely with partners and asking, how can we help you? And I think the, the visitors would be very, very delighted um, that you have thought about them in a more holistic way. I just want to say one thing. Um, Lisa showed me this amazing book uh, from the conference she just went to, and I had to write down this quote from William J. Mayo. He wrote this in terms of patients. He wrote, the best interest of the patient is the only interest to be considered. And I think if we substituted the word visitor, we'd say the best interest of the visitor is the only interest to be considered. So when we think about all the variety of interests of our visitors, their health and wellness is, of course, primary in their mind. And we can find ways to meet them there. Carl, you just raised an interesting point in teaming up with Michelle Obama in the Let's Get Moving campaign. Is this a point at which museums should be very actively participating in public policy, perhaps even trying to drive it in this regard? I, I think it's um, <coughs> very much a role that museums can play. And it, particularly in history museums that I represent, um, you know, we really do have a lot of public policy issues right now um, around healthcare. Um, great debates going on in our society, Ebola in the news constantly, and debates about how we handle that, how we react to it, um, how institutions uh, deal with people um, who are experiencing the disease. Um, so where do we talk about those things? Um, we really have an opportunity to undertake the role of the museum as a forum um, to have discussions about uh, things that affect uh, societal decisions, and I think that's a good example. I wonder what, there's a, a lot of my research too when I was going through this, and I, this may not necessarily be your area of expertise, both of you, but, but what do the neurosciences tell us now about just why biologically people are drawn to art? Because I was thinking about this too, and, and why does art work perhaps more than sports or, or some other discipline? The, 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 this discussion in this uh, platform seems to be the one that really resonates. Um. I'm not an expert in that, but I think that there is a lot of neuroscience uh, study in this area. And uh, I would go back to ancient times, actually, to look at this connection uh, between the artist and the healer. Uh, and St. Luke was uh, considered the patron saint of artists. He, he's said to have discovered the fresco or invented the, the religious fresco, as I understand it. And, uh, he is said to be the only person to have painted Jesus, I think, from real life, although they lived more than 150 years apart. Um, uh, and he is uh, also, he was a physician himself, and he was a patron, patron saint of healers, uh, coincidentally. And I think it has something to do with the right side and the left side of the brain being able to appreciate uh, the large context and the details simultaneously to, um, accept and balance ambiguity uh, while moving forward in decision making. Um, I, I think there are, there's many, many connections and I think there is a lot of neuroscience, particularly functional MRI studies, looking at the power of arts to heal. And that includes the visual arts, um, literature, theater, and music that Lisa is an expert in. And oh. I think the um the attention to detail, and we get very excited in medicine about the one shadow on that large x-ray, uh, because that, that may be the, the actual diagnosis. Or, and, and the same thing happens when you're looking at a piece of art. You're looking at the, the big piece, but when you're really coning down and spending time with visual thinking strategies, for example, and just really coning down more and more, you feel like the world is it's like peeling open an onion. And it's the same approach. Uh, looking, at, and I, I go back to, you know, it's because we are, at, we aspire to beauty and excellence, both in medicine and in art, and so really it's, it, it's the same approach to just two different functions, and that, that's why they call it the art of healing, and I, I do think that we should be called the, the avenue of the art of healing. We'll, we'll, we'll sign up for that one too. <laughs> Um, at the museum, one of the most beautiful paintings we have is a Roger van der Weyden of St. Luke painting the Virgin Mary. And uh, so that would be an interesting picture to talk about. Uh. 
I wonder, are there risks and liabilities that you all have to be aware of in your institutions if, it's, if you're going to have yoga in the lobby or, or other programs of that sort? There are always reasons for not doing things. <laughs> <laughs> and people can come up with them, I've heard, in large organizations. But, uh, or small. <laughs> At the conference I was at in, in art and healthcare, and again, it was coming from the other side, uh, there at the Mayo Clinic, they have a program called Art at the Bedside, where, where um, actual teaching artists go to the bedside and create art with the patients. And there's also music at the bedside and writing at the bedside. But uh, what they found is sometimes they hit that, oops, that I did. <laughs> they, they hit that, that, that point of pain where it really brings something out of the, the patient that uh, they need psychological care and things. And so what they've done is they partner with an art therapist, with a music therapist who's on call for when a visiting artist or teaching artist reaches that point where uh, that opened up something that maybe the patient had not yet um, uh, accessed. And so, so a partnership that way with, you know, just again, more and more collaboration of these, the fields that we're in, um, I think is gonna start to really uh, solve that problem. Um, in in the context of people being anxious about things, the difficulties and so on, museums can make anything, anything a cause for anxiety, to be perfectly honest. Uh, but critical partners in our relationship uh, with the medical profession have been private collectors, artists, art students who have a, a role to play, and they are much more positive in simply seeing their stuff used on the walls of, uh, of hospitals or, 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 or wherever. They're less fearful than museums sometimes are, I would say, and they're critical partners, some of those artists. I'm going to steal your role for a second though, Jared, because um, this, you, the UP program that Anita uh, was talking about is universal placement, universal personnel, universal uh, participation, and so Mass Cultural Council is really looking at trying to make all of the cultural spaces as accessible to everyone with, because that is going to make it accessible not just to those who have uh, accessibility issues, but to all of us. And, and so one of the things that she was focusing on is the education of the staff um, in, in accessibility and universal. And I think that would reduce this anxiety that... Um, yes. But so there's always can that you speak anxiety. About that? Will yeah. something be damaged? What, who, who handles the insurance? Who, you know, it becomes, it can become a major issue, and the vision has to really dominate. I think. But I remember right. that that we were all quite moved by how uh, the entire MFA staff has been educated now in uh, accessibility and universal design, mm -hmm. um, and that so so that it's a cultural change within the museum. And it's the same at the Mass Cultural Council staff. It's a cultural, cultural shift because it's not that the disabilities person in the, that committee is mm. in charge of everybody else. It's that we're all, as a community, more aware. Well, that's good for team building as well because we all feel proud of what we're doing in these new initiatives. It's tremendous. Before I turn it over to the audience for questions, I just want to ask each of you in, in just a couple of sentences if you have, on a more personal level, one moment or, or one experience, one observation that has been a revelation to you about finding art healing? You would go to me first. I would, <laughs> sorry. I picked on Malcolm already, so. Well, I think I'd have to go to one of the experiences from our Morning Star Access program where um, this uh, little boy who uh, was severely autistic who wasn't able to play out in the community, and he... Um, went into our big climber. Those of you that know the Children's Museum, one of our big central you know, challenges is this three-story climbing structure. Yeah, there's not a map there. I yeah. took my nephew there, and I realized until he, when he got up at the top that there's no getting him down. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you know, he, he got in there, and uh, his uh, mother had said that there were so many times when he had, had been to the museum with his siblings and had looked at it longingly and never was able to go in and that uh, his ability to go in and go through the climber was truly transformational for him as a child. And you know, these are extraordinarily touching moments when you realize that the role the museum has played in the very personal life of, of, of this child and, and many others. So you know, I, uh, I'm just I'm doing my best to keep the 
uh, donors who give to that program really happy and engaged with that program because I, I really think it has to grow and expand and perhaps ex expand throughout the uh, New England area as well. I'll mention a story that actually involves both of us. Uh, Malcolm and I were together at lunch at Bravo, the MFA restaurant, a few years ago. And I spotted across the room a local television personality who I knew. And I took Malcolm over to meet the person who he did not then know. Um, and we asked the gentleman you know, what he was doing. He was alone in the restaurant. Um, and he said that his mother was in the hospital across the street um, and that it had been quite a traumatic morning for him. Um, and he wanted to get away to a place of peace and quiet and calm. Um, and so he came to the museum. And it's something that stuck with me for many years, um, that role that we can play in museums to offer that respite and well-being to people. I had this experience about three weeks ago. I was in Bravo, and a couple came in and came up to the table and said, thank you for all the museum does. And um, after my lunch, I went up to their table and said, well, have you had an enjoyable lunch? And they said, well, we, we came here for a very special reason. One of our dearest friends died. It was her memorial service this morning, and we felt the museum was the best place mm -hmm. to come to. My other story is that when I was six, seven, or eight, I had a problem that took me to hospital every six weeks to the neighboring big city. We went by train. And as a reward for my being patient uh, in the hospital, my mother took me to the local museum there as a reward. And I'll, of course, always remember those first visits. Um, there's many, uh, many wonderful positive moments, but I'll just ref on one that was actually reported to me by one of our interns who participated in our curriculum. And uh, he actually eventually published this in the journal Lancet. And so if you want to read about it, you can learn more. Dr. Josh Liao. Uh, and he discussed how that he was rotating in the intensive care unit at the time and dealing with uh, some very difficult, tragic uh, patients and their families who were having a tough time coping with someone who was uh, dying at a young age, and he went to the MFA and spent an evening with the Etruscan sarcophagus, which is a magnificent work of beauty, and uh, uh, ten it's a tender piece if you haven't seen it, and he wrote in his article, and he told us about how that helped him reframe the entire relationship that he was having with this patient, and by doing that was able to help them uh, get through the uh, very tragic moment. The story I have is about an even broader collaboration. Uh, last year, Mass Cultural Council celebrated the Creative Youth Development Program, the 20th anniversary. Um, and uh, one of the culminating events was a huge party at the, the, the Gardner Museum. And the highlight for me was that Shakespeare Actors Project, which, uh, uses, uh, which trains um, inner city youth in Shakespeare. Uh, had the opportunity to have that balcony scene with two young teenagers actually enacting it in the Gardner Museum, in that garden. And mm -hmm. if you can imagine how gorgeous that was. There, there they were, they were in their jeans, you know, and but, but she, Juliet was up on the second floor and he was in the courtyard. And just thinking of the many, many layers of healing that was going on with these two young people who had been trained in this, this world that wasn't theirs, but they'll never forget that moment. And none of us did because it's just so beautiful. And I always thought that that scene should be enacted in the, the Gardner Museum anyway, but it, 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 it's, it's just, so, that was terrific. It's collaboration. Again, you know, many, many collaborations together. All right, well, I'm happy to turn it over at this point. I'm sure you have many, many, many questions, and we, we have, I think, about uh, 15 minutes for those. So who has the first question for our panel? So I have to work for another 15 minutes is what you're telling me. <laughs> uh, right here in the pink. Oh, we have a microphone speeding its way toward you as we speak. Some years ago, I was organizing the Michigan Museum Association Conference, planning a whole year, and that morning I was driving to open the conference and listen to the radio, and the date was uh, September 11th. Obviously, the conference did not take place, but I think the takeaway message that came to me from that experience 
was that we have these tremendous resources and we've had a great conversation this morning on how to use these resources to the general public. Mm -hmm. But we also need to remind ourselves to use them to heal our own staff and ourselves so that we can better you do our job to the public. And so I think it's sort of just a reminder that we are part of the, the community that needs to be healed and to use these tremendous assets and resources that we are all have uh, to be able to continue to do that. Other questions? Right here in the, in the front. Actually, we'll just wait one second for the microphone so that everybody can hear. I think Dr. Katz said a very important word, and I think it's one of the places that museums and healthcare professions meet, and that was the word ambiguity. Mm -hmm. We put a great deal of stock in knowing and being certain, mm -hmm. um, and I believe that one of the things that the direct encounter with history, with the sciences, with art in museums fosters is a tolerance for ambiguity, mm -hmm. a sense of our humanity, the limitations of our knowledge, our encounter with mystery and subtlety. And I will say, um, three years ago, I walked into Children's Hospital with my then 18-year-old son, who had a tumor so rare that no one had ever survived it and walked out of the hospital. Uh, he's alive. He walked out of Children's. Um, I know that at least one of the doctors took that our diagnosis course. Um, and that the first and only time I left the hospital in eight months was when a museum colleague, Ray Williams, came, put a sweater around my shoulders, said, you're getting out of here, walked me five blocks to the gardener, which was terrifying, um, and had me sit in the courtyard where I had sat many times and reconnected with beauty, the outside of the world, and a sense that things are uh, when they are as extreme as they can possibly be, we fall back on our sense of direct experience and the talents of ambiguity. So I don't really have a question, but to say this, you are so on to something so real, and my thank you gift to Boston Children's Hospital is a project called Neighborhood Respite Walks, which are 10-minute walks to see works of art from the hospital, mm -hmm. which was on Monday adopted by the Healthy Hospital Program and the Center for Families as a gift. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question from uh, someone on Twitter. Um, what, have been, what have been your experiences, this is for the doctors, uh, what have been your experiences at other non-art museums? Can you talk a little bit more about how they can serve health education? Well, Carol talked about the, the wonderful healing that goes on at the Children's Hospital, and of course, um, the Muse Museum of Science was some place that I, I lived when my kids were growing up, um, uh, because I got more time to play with the, 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 the um, anatomical things, and I would get very excited to come and see this, this, this hand with six fingers, and I'd explain the entire uh, pathophysiology to the kids who, who were like, <laughs> but but they, they, I think they, they picked up on my enthusiasm. Um, but, but I also, I was thinking about that when, when I was trying to think of which, which example I was going to use when Jared asked that. But even a child who has a range of limitation of, you know, of, of, of stretching their arms and things, when they're brought to something like the Museum of Science to push a button and then all the gears and the wheels start to go around, uh, that kind of cause and effect, and just those opportunities to, to sort of be free and to explore um, any of the museums that, that all of you are representing are the things that sort of open up the mind to things that they may not have thought of in the classroom or couldn't imagine from looking at an iPad. Just being right there to see the, the enormity of a blue whale, for example. One thing that we haven't mentioned uh, thus far that I think relates to this question too is that we have an opportunity here in Boston um, for a lot of medical education, biology education and so forth in very direct um, exhibitions and programs. Um, the Paul Russell Museum of Medical Innovation, um, for example, um, that uh, Historic New England supported the development of that as MGH was working to create that museum a couple of years ago. Um, you can go there and learn a lot about medicine and what it does and, and, and get reassured or, or raise some more ambiguity um, about what's going on um, with that. And of course at the Museum of Science we have the new Hall of Human Life, um, which is an interactive engagement um, for everyone 
um, on healthcare issues. So I think that's another opportunity um, that we have in various types of museums to learn more that helps us with our medical understanding. And I would add that although uh, what I do is mostly at art museums, the lessons I think are broadly applicable. And as an example, uh, one of the exercises we do with our students is we actually take them either to the mall or to the airport. And we practice observation in outside the museum and it's extremely effective uh, exercise. And I, I think that you can do this type of work in almost any setting in another type of museum I think would be easily amenable. I mean, going back to, or is there a question? There's a question right yeah. in the back. <laughs> okay, we can hear you. I'll repeat it back. In case you didn't hear, it was the question about the, the, the traveling body worlds and exhibitions of that kind. If there's a sensationalized, uh, sensationalizing of those exhibitions. Well, I didn't go see the one that was at uh, Quincy Market Body World. Did any of you go see that? Uh, I don't know. We have an exhibit that we're um, actually developing right now, uh, What's for Dinner? which is about um, healthy eating and uh, families uh, eating and speaking and cooking together. And uh, that will hopefully be a traveling exhibit. Um, and again, I think it goes back to the kind of whole person, the whole family. So I think those exhibits uh, that are encouraging people to uh, engage more with each other and explore avenues for better health probably are the most successful. As I said, I know there was the, this human body uh, you know, exhibition uh, that I don't know what anyone, I don't know if any museum. The only thing I'd say about it is as long as, if, if it's uh, with someone who can help to curate the experience that the child is, is having, um, and I think that's what we look for in our museums um, because that has been, you know, again, the museum is a place where you can trust where the information is going to be sort of thoughtfully presented and, um, and, and so that helps the educational aspect and the educational health, uh, the, the overall health of the child. Uh, I worry about Faneuil Hall having, um, you know, um, having a, a, a model of, a, of, of muscle, muscle, you know, and also I think there were, there's rumors of where those bodies came from that always makes me a little bit creeped out, so. Hi, um, I I know that uh, you know Malcolm had brought up a, a really good point that sometimes it's very difficult to connect with some of these other institutions, and obviously museums are huge institutions, hospitals are huge institutions. It's hard to know who to talk to. Um, so I actually uh, run the art and exhibits for the Boston Children's Hospital. Um, and we were able to connect about six years ago with the Museum of Fine Arts and fortunately have a wonderful program. Um, and, um, you know, so just in, in thinking about how, um, how museums and other institutions can reach outside of their walls into the community and especially into hospitals, um, you know, the, the education department from, from your end has been, you know, how we've been able to connect. And um, the, um, in, on our side, if anybody's <laughs> interested, the, if, they, if they have an art program, which we're lucky enough to, um, that's a great place to start, but the child life department is actually who deals with all of the interaction with kids and it, they're, they're all about making play and normalization and bringing these kind of things and the Center for Families is wonderful. But could some of the, the other folks as, as well speak about um, how uh, you can get these resources and things out to the community outside your walls, ways that you've been able to do that? I know it's difficult because all the objects and exhibits and everything is inside this building, um, you know, and then if we're kind of stuck over at the hospital, it's hard to get it over there sometimes. So just maybe if there's a couple of other um, ideas about how that can happen. Well, I suppose I could say a little bit about our um, Race to the Top program. Um, this isn't particularly to do with health and wellness, although I, 
I kind of now feel that um, almost everything we do uh, at the Children's Museum is around the health and well-being of the community. Um, we were very fortunate to receive funding from Race to the Top to take our uh, early learning and um, educational programs out to museums and libraries across the state. And what's really been very, very awe-inspiring is that libraries are, are wonderful resources uh, for community um, engagement and connection to museums. And uh, we've been working probably with 70 museums and about 60 libraries across the Commonwealth and uh, taking kits and resources out to them. And those are going directly to families. And what we're doing now um, is starting to work with some of the community health centers in Boston, um, such as uh, the Dimmick Center. And um, we are thinking about how we can convert some of these uh, materials for home visits. So uh, again, I, I think um, working with child life specialists um, has been very fruitful for us in all the hospitals in this, this area. But I think it is really a challenge for museums to have a lot of heft outside of their institutions. I mean, I'd be interested to hear Malcolm and Carl. You know, uh, one of the things we've invested a lot in the Children's Museum is access in order to get people to our museum. You know, the $1 Friday night, and we've pioneered this uh, EBT discount program, which many of you have now taken on. I'm so thrilled to see it, where people can show their food stamp identification and get a, a, a lesser admission. But I do think it's something we have to be very creative about to be able to have a presence in schools and in libraries and in hospitals. Uh, because you know, our, our core experience is really within our walls. And you know, we can do a lot of, we've just developed an app, we have a very vibrant website. But that one-to-one -one experience Lisa was talking about where you actually really interact with individuals, with educators, with someone that can steward the experience for them is, is really priceless. And I think it's a challenge for us to find a way to get out there. I think one of the saddest things I see in my life is people from retirement communities visiting the museum. And then you gradually see familiar faces and no longer able to come to the museum. Mm -hmm. And perhaps we should be going more to retirement communities and a sheltered accommodation and so on. It is obviously um, very consumptive of resources. But you've also mentioned something else that gave me an idea. Uh, we're all electrified now, we're all wired. Why don't we do more in terms of programs on uh, accessible through our website for people who specifically, specifically can't mm -hmm. uh, visit uh, the, the museum. I think it's an interesting mm -hmm. idea. Mm -hmm. We actually have at Historic New England put an emphasis on partnerships over the last uh, five or six years um, and found that the doors are very easily opened um, if we go knocking, um, that people are looking for partnerships and are very willing to do it. And as a result, we have been able to get out into senior centers um, as a good example um, and do pro take programs out um, into the community. Uh, that way, but but I think the simple answer to me is it's it's not really as hard to get a door open and to get a yes as you think um, if you go knocking and ask. Carol brought up a really interesting point, though. Uh, we've been talking about art at the bedside or art bringing a patient to the to the museum, but what is the role of the museum in public health and and getting messages out to you know partnerships with a, a community health center and you know broader education of a community in in um, understanding sort of community art or um, the, the, the art experience that way. Do you want last word, Jared? The boss is standing over my shoulder. Usually she's little and blonde, but <laughs> Emily Rooney, for those of you who are not in, in Boston. I guess that's our time, right? That is our time. And I think all I can say on behalf of the crowd is wow. <laughs> Thank you. What a terrific discussion. I think uh, this is going to be a fuel for thought for us for the rest of the, uh, the conference, honestly. It was absolutely terrific. So thank you once again, Carol, Carl, Malcolm, Lisa, Joel, and Jared for bringing this to us and your insights. So just a minute of housekeeping before we adjourn here. Again, if you're using social media, we're using hashtag NEMA2014 on Twitter and Instagram. And another reminder that we have free Wi-Fi throughout the building. Yay. The network is NEMA2014 and there is no password. 
Also, to accommodate our large crowd, all sessions that were to be held in Thomas Payne B. room are being moved to the Empress Ballroom on the 14th floor. So all sessions marked Thomas A. Thomas Paine A will stay in the Thomas Paine room. It's just a little bigger. But those marked Thomas Paine B will be on the Empress Ballroom on the upstairs. So it's almost lunchtime, as if your stomachs hadn't already told you that, and it's my job to tell you where to find it. Those of you registered for the Directors and Trustees Luncheon will be up on the 16th floor in the Charles View Ballroom. All the rest of us attending the opening luncheon will be served in two locations, right here in the President's Ballroom and in the Empress Ballroom on the 14th floor. Regardless of where you choose to eat, we ask that you leave the ballroom here for the next 15 minutes so that we can get the tables set up. As you leave the ballroom, you'll find NEMA staff and volunteers to help you find your way. Have a great conference, everybody.